Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I will rely on you to send messages down to me to ensure that I stick to that period of time. I also would like to thank you for introducing our distinguished guests here this morning, because if I was to read the list, half of my uh, presentation would be taken up with time. I just want to point out that one of the most important components of this uh, consultancy here today and the fact that it has been, the subject matter has been really the worry of anybody who has been responsible for managing, administering Dominica, certainly throughout the 20th century and into this one, is that the platform for raising the funds necessary to finance development activities. This has been the challenge of all administrators of Dominica, particularly, as I said, into the 20th century. The challenge of doing this, um, basically of finding ways in which you can generate funds to do the things that are necessary to provide the services for the well-being of the people of Dominica. Now, during the colonial period, of course, the idea was that this was a giant plantation and you should suck as much money out of this island as possible for the benefit of the colonial power. That changed by the end of the 19th century. But even then, the idea was that you had to raise funds to finance development on your own. The, the days of, of foreign grant aid and that kind of thing had not yet come in. And therefore, the colony had to raise through taxes, through export taxes particularly, because income tax was very low indeed, the money to be able to finance the needs of the particular colony. So that if you were a weak colony, naturally you would not be having the infrastructural development that others would have, let's say Barbados or Jamaica or Trinidad. And Dominica, of course, because of this challenge that dogged it and still continues to throughout its life, is the topography. If you have to understand Dominica, first you have to understand its topography. This has dominated the entire history and fortunes or lack of fortunes of Dominica. The fact that you have to deal with a volcanic, mountainous island that is susceptible on a regular basis to destruction of one kind or another. And therefore, the history of Dominica has been this constant hiccup of development, and then, as we saw with Erica or Hurricane David or hurricanes in the 1930s or whatever, periods where you have to um, rebuild. So it's a case of two steps forward, four steps back, and then you build up again, and then you get lashed one more time. And that is the reality of all administrators in Dominica. So inevitably, what you found is that the colonies could not raise enough cash to be able to do development. And if you go through the history of the 20th century, you will see the periods where that development was possible because of the economic well-being of Dominica. We had, at the beginning of the 20th century, a period where limes were dominant. We were the largest single producers of limes and lime products in the world. And um, it was not just juice. We're talking about citrate of lime that was used in US industry, etc. All types of lime products. And when we look around us, we are in fact benefiting from some of those things today. For instance, things like the High Court building, which was a treasury and customs, was constructed with lime money right there on the bayfront. Very important because customs income was necessary to run the colony. The road from Portsmouth to Hatton Garden, for instance, entirely financed by lime money. And many of the bridges, the representative there for Pebush Dodan area, those bridges that are over 100 years old, we still use today. Um, very strong cast concrete bridges. And we will note, too, at that time, the focus of that kind of investment. When you drive from Portsmouth to Hatton Garden, you pass through every estate yard all along the way, whether it is Blenheim, Hampstead, Hodges, Woodford Hill, Eden, Londonderry, Melville Hall, Hatton Garden. They didn't care about the villages, they didn't care whether you were living in a thatched hut or what. The focus was the plantations. 
Um, earlier on, of course, you also had uh, funds coming in for the development of roads and bridges and that sort of thing, particularly under the administration of Hesketh Bell, who was a British administrator with some grand ideas. He realized that you needed foreign investment, and he promoted an idea of developing the interior of the island up in the area of Brantridge and Penrice and um, the Layou Flats, etc. But in typical state of Dominica, he brought in some 400 British families to invest in coffee and cocoa and uh, limes as well. I uh, built the, the imperial road that goes up to, to Pocasse and other um, roads and developments across. But then the First World War came and you had a collapse and uh, therefore his, his project never really developed. But this was an effort uh, to do it. And so we sank ourselves by the 1930s into a terrible period of depression. 1929, you had the Wall Street crash, um, and this, of course, caused uh, economic mayhem across the world. In Dominica, of course, with this policy of having to be able to maintain yourself based on the taxes that you rec receive from exports, with Lyme collapse due to wither tip and red root disease, as well as the economic problems of the world, Dominica and the other islands of the Eastern Caribbean were sunk into massive depression. Here we could grow what we ate, so we did not have the riot strikes and confusion that happened elsewhere, except of course in the Kalinago territory when they wanted to stop people from getting their supplies from Martinique and Guadeloupe um, by the back door and we had the uprising there in 1930 um, at Salibia. But the point of the matter is that in elsewhere, in Barbados and, and Jamaica, you had riot strikes and everything. Dominica could provide for itself. Now, it, it, next year, we'll actually make it 80 years since the British government realized that these islands were in crisis and that something had to be done to allow them to put themselves on their feet you could not have countries without a proper port, no airports, no clinics, no proper reservoirs for water, no schools, for instance, uh, supply of schools apart from those big one-room classrooms that some people may remember in places like La Plaine and Penville and all these sites. And so what they did, the British government, is they instituted a commission of inquiry to go through the islands, and it's 80 years ago, next year, uh, since they came to Dominica, and they went everywhere. They asked everybody questions about the conditions of the island. And it was a very damning report. This is the Moyne Commission, which they put out and gave to the British government in 1940. But the war had started, and the British government decided that the report was so damning about the condition of the colonies and the way they were managing the colonies that the Germans could have used it as propaganda. And so they suppressed the report until 1945. But what the British government did is they instituted the Colonial Development and Welfare Funds, CD and W funds. Now that was one way of providing Dominica with the things it needed to put itself on its feet. These are the reports of the Colonial Development Welfare Fund. Every year or two years, they recorded the, the cost and the building of everything. So you can look for 1951-52 and you will find a purchase of Goodwill Estate for the building of the Princess Margaret Hospital, which was up in the Guava Bushes on the hillside. Um, the new prison, the prison farm over at um, Stock Farm, Stock Farm itself, Coco, um, uh, agricultural stations up and down the islands. All of these reports can show you the kind of development that was happening in the island during that period, funded by the Colonial Development Welfare Funds. Mr. Leblanc was very lucky because he came in and roads were being built left, right, and center thanks to these funds, many of them set up before he became in power. But when he was in power, the roads were open. So Leblanc Banu Chimé, and he benefited from that. He also benefited from the fact that although Mr. Barron had slaved away building Melville Hall Airport, he won the election just before the airport was opened. And so <clears throat> Mr. Leblanc opened the airport. 
But the fact of the matter is, those CD&W funds provided us with the platform. Princess Margaret Hospital, I mentioned, the dock facilities, the road across the island, the building of the airport, although we were the last island in the Caribbean to get an airport. But still, um, it provided us with the means to do this. So basically, what we have is that period of uh, going up into the 1950s and 60s, and correlating with that, was the big developments under the banana industry. Because with the banana industry, which the British wanted because they wanted bananas in Britain, and therefore they would ensure that they would assist with the building of feeder roads and the extension of dock facilities and that kind of thing. So thanks to bananas, we benefited from these developmental um, projects. But it was based entirely on protectionism as Dominica's history, economic history had proved. The fact that we were allied to Britain as part of one of the members of the empire, we were protected and our market was protected. And the fact was that as soon as that protectionism was withdrawn, whether it was for grapefruit, whether it was for limes, whether it was particularly from bananas, we then found ourselves competing with the rest of the world. And that's a story that all of us are fully um, aware of. So the CDNW funds then, by the 1960s, began to decline. And this year is 50th anniversary of self-government. 50 years ago, 1st of March, 1967, the Constitution was changed. Right there at the House of Assembly, a new Constitution was handed over, and we celebrated on the 3rd of November that year, our first um, statehood uh, celebrations. But what it meant is we were entirely responsible for internal affairs. Britain would only do defense and external affairs. And so the challenge of trying to find developmental funds increased. Mr. Leblanc, for instance, realized that all those feeder roads that were being constructed, they needed to be maintained. He instituted a 2% tax on the uh, banana exports, and of course, as happens in Dominica, demonstration outside the ministry, which was down in High Street. My dear friend here's father, Mr. Barron, on the top of a Land Rover, you know, saying he want to kill the banana industry. But the thing is, the fact of the matter is that you required this money to be able to maintain those feeder roads. You had to begin to earn and find ways, the grants were over, of getting the money. Okay, so I, <laughs> thank you. So the point of the matter is, um, once we got into to, um, the 1980s, what you find is we are beginning to adopt, and I'm, I, I've been given two minutes, uh, we began to adopt this uh, Arthur Lewis model of industrialization by invitation. But by that time, it was already too late because the world was expanding and it was far cheaper to have these factories in the Philippines and Guatemala and, and even China. Uh, and therefore, this attempt that Eugenia Charles uh, uh, advanced, the building of the industrial sheds, for instance, at Canefield, etc., we were, we were late on the draw. And, and so this challenge continues. Um, and on independence, we lost a lot of big investment like El Rose and Company pulled out. Geist Industries sold off all of their l land that they actually were planting bananas on because they saw what was coming up. And essentially, from the 1980s, in her independence address of 1993, Eugenia Strauss outlines the situation in which we found ourselves. Our high point was 1988. The income from bananas was fantastic. We were really booming with the tourism in its limited way, but the collapse began after 1992. And she laments in that independence address of 1993 the way that things uh, had happened. And so she also got involved in the other CBI, that is the Caribbean Basin Initiative, where they were hoping, <laughs> they were hoping that they would invent, draw U.S. investment with uh, Reagan, who was a good buddy of hers, uh, bring investment into Dominica. But of course, that did, did not take place. And so um, the challenges went into the period of the UWP when uh, in 
uh, Eugenia Charles on the 31st of May 1991 instituted Parliament passed that first citizenship by investment program, which as has been outlined by the financial secretary, changed and developed over time and has become what it is now. Because even the government, the party that criticized Eugenia Charles for instituting this program, when they got in power, they realized, my God, where are we going to get money from to do things for this country? And so they had to make it a new name and they called it the re-engineered economic citizenship program. So the point of the matter is every administration that gets in that seat of power is faced with this amazing, challenging job. Where and how do we get this money to be able to run the country? And the Prime Minister here has had to deal with it and he has found ways in which we are dealing with it now to be able to do what the Financial Secretary pointed out that other than that, we'd have to be taking loans, we'd have to be borrowing money, and grants have dried up. I could go on, of course, it's a whole thesis. Yes, yes look, sir, But I, you, uh, I just wanted to bring you to this particular time. And Miss, if you could engage one thing about passports, I just want to point out that when we were a British colony, all of us carried a passport called United Kingdoms, United Kingdom and Colonies. There were almost a billion people around the world that carried or could carry that United Kingdoms and Colonies passport, which meant that you had a billion people possibly coming into Dominica because everybody had the right, just as Dominicans <laughs> went to Ghana, we had a number of Dominicans that went to Ghana and their descendants are still there, they could go to Australia because they were citizens of the British Empire. If I use my personal example, my grandfather born in Barbados, my grandmother in Trinidad, came to settle in Dominica over 100 years ago, came, went, because they were also citizens. I'm sure there are many people here who have Kittitians and other ancestors from An Antigua, for instance, the whole of Barragat and Wesley, if you want, mm -hmm. um, from these countries who freely could come in to, to live here. On the other side of my family, my grandfather was born in Singapore, my grandmother in Scotland. They came and they settled in Dominica because they had a right through their passport. Mm -hmm. And they even became members of the House of Assembly, I mean, to add to it. So the point of the matter is that although we are concerned that there are all these passports, all these citizens out there, it doesn't mean that all of them are going to come and settle in Dominica. And those that are coming in, they have already been vetted, as the financial secretary pointed out, um, and that there was a time prior to statehood when there were millions of people out there in the big wide world in what was the British Empire and Commonwealth carrying passports that allowed them the right to come and visit Dominica, just as it allowed Dominicans to go and live in those other countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.